We'll still have straggler cards if you want to pass them in. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take those in. Um, and while people are doing that, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Jean Cazes. Uh, she uh, teaches uh, philosophy and she also uh, has a uh, uh, blog uh, that uh, is an in living color, if I got that right? Um, which uh, is uh, engaged in uh, various debates in the, the atheist blogosphere. So uh, that's uh, uh, perhaps of interest, and perhaps many of you have run into uh, some of her stuff there already. Um, she's going to be talking to us about uh, the philosophy of parenthood, or in particular parenthood and meaning, I guess. So, uh, Jean, welcome. Um, let's see, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, two puzzles about parenting. Um, um, so, first puzzle uh, is what's in it for me. So this is sort of a, a puzzle about, well both of these puzzles are, are uh, about the kind of thoughts we have when we decide to have children or not have children. And um, I, I present these as puzzles. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue uh, one way or the other about having children. These are puzzles. Um, Aristotle said uh, philosophy begins in wonder. And I don't think he really meant the kind of wonder you feel when you're kind of lying on the ground, staring at the sky, like, ooh, I really wonder. It's more like being puzzled. And so I'm going to try to get you puzzled. And at, at, at the end, I will try to kind of un, uh, unravel some of these puzzles. But I might not have time. If all I do is get you puzzled, that I will feel that you know, I've served my purpose. Um, OK, so the first puzzle is, what's in it for me? Um, now, I think that we, you know, when parents have children, especially new parents, they all tell you um, that children are the ultimate. I remember before I had kids, uh, my sister-in-law telling me, uh, children are the ultimate. And I think that's what a lot of people feel. Uh, people talk about the joy of being parents, the, the meaningfulness of being parents. Um, but now here's where the puzzle comes in. Um, when uh, empirical psychologists really study the experience of being a parent, it, it doesn't really exactly fit this, uh, this notion that a parenthood is the ultimate. Um, so, for example, this is from a study by the psychologist Daniel Kahneman um, using what's called the uh, day reconstruction method. So what he did is he took, he, he asked 900 employed women who happened to be in Texas um, to reconstruct their, the last 24 hours of their, uh, of their life. That sounds wrong. Uh, let's, let's, let's put it, wait, to reconstruct the previous day. Um, the previous 24 hours and to list all their different activities and to talk about how happy or unhappy they felt during those activities. Now, if you look at that list, um, the, it, it, I, I have to turn. Um, so, intimate relations is top, you know, top of the list in terms of what makes you happy. Socializing after work, relaxing, dinner, lunch, exercising, prayer slash worship. Very interesting question, actually. Side issue, you know. Does this count? <laughs> this the kind of, I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, socializing at work, watching TV, phone at home, napping, cooking, shopping, computer, housework, and then child care. So the enjoyment of just being with your kids turns out to be very, very low on that list. Um, so, <laughs> so there's my first puzzle. Like, what's going on there that everybody tells you that parenthood is the ultimate, and yet the empirical psychologists don't find this sort of great joy that the people talk about? Okay, so hopefully we'll have time at the end of my, my allotted 15 minutes to, talk, uh, to uh, try to sort of unravel that a little bit more. But let's go on to the, um, the next puzzle, is what's in it for the kids? So um, again, you've got sort of the appearance and the reality. Um, the appearance is that we think of uh, creating a child as sort of giving the child a gift, uh, you know, the gift of life. It's a good thing, you know, surely. 
And uh, we think each of us sort of thinks, uh, feels sort of lucky to be alive. Um, here's a lovely passage from um, Richard Dawkins. Uh, this is what he says he wants to have read at his own funeral. It's a really nice passage from Unweaving the Rainbow. Um, we, are, we are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could, could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. Certainly, those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively outnumbers the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I in our ordinariness that are here. You are lucky to be alive, and so am I. So, we're each lucky to be alive. That's sort of the, sounds right. All right, now let's get puzzled about that. Um, I'm going to give you an argument that, uh, in fact, the people we bring into the world are not lucky to be brought into the world. Um, in fact, we should not bring them into the world. Now, I hasten to say, this is not my argument. Um, I, this is an argument made by a philosopher named David Benatar uh, from South Africa. And uh, so I'm just going to try to explain his argument. Um, now, to do this vividly, I kind of need uh, two couples to, uh, you don't need to come up here, you don't need to, I need to just uh, make a prediction about your future if you were to choose to have children. Okay, so um, who would like, anybody sort of thinking about maybe I want to, maybe I don't want to. You might already have children thinking about having another one. Anybody willing to be my Okay, all right. So that's my first couple. No, nothing weird will happen to you. I'm not going to do anything, you know. Second couple, I need another couple. Come on. Well, where are you having one? Does that count? Okay. Uh, well, no, let's not, let's not go there, okay? <laughs> um, uh, you two, in the front row. Will you be my guinea pig? Okay. Okay. <laughs> it, it's harmless. It will do nothing. Okay. Now, my, my, my first couple, I, I, I just need to make this vivid. So, um, you will imagine deciding yes or no. Um, what I want to uh, do, I, I was going to look in my crystal ball and to sort of predict what your children, what, your, what would happen. Unfortunately, I left my crystal ball in the car. Um, so, I will just, okay, I've got it. Um, if you choose to have children, there's going to be a very odd outcome. Um, you're going to have twins, and one of the twins is going to be perfectly happy uh, all the time. We'll call that one happy. <laughs> and uh, the other one is going to be perfectly miserable all the time. We'll call that one sad. Okay, so twin pregnancy. All right, now you two, should you decide to have children, um, you're going to have just one child who will be more happy than sad, and we'll call that one happy sad. Okay, there we go. Now, I knew you were going to say that. I, I knew it was going to turn out that way, to be to be perfectly honest. So let's first talk about this twin pregnancy. And we're going to talk about it in order to shed light on your pregnancy, which is a little more unlikely, because most people are some combination of happy and sad. So first, the twin pregnancy. Um, the, half, the sad uh, kid is on the left. The happy kid is on the right. Um, and if you think about just the, the sad kid first, the one that's always miserable, it seems like you have every reason not to create that sad kid. Always miserable, why would you want to have it? So obvious that um, the world's a better place for the absence of that constantly miserable person. All right, now let's look at um, the other child. If uh, things are really symmetrical, then we would want to say that you'd have every reason to have that constantly happy child. Um, and yet, if you think about it, it doesn't really seem correct to say uh, that things are symmetrical. Um, because if you, uh, if you sort of think of the world as it is right now, where you know, the happy child, the constantly happy child doesn't exist, it doesn't seem like the absence of that child is a bad thing. Um, it's not as if that non-existent happy child is sort of locked in a closet, suffering and you know, trying to come out. That's just a, a sort of a possible child. Um, so it seems like it's not right to think of that 
constantly have a child. It, it, it seems that you do not have every reason to have that happy child. And in fact, you really don't have any reason to have that constantly happy child. It's just a possibility. It's not suffering from not existing. Um, so that's what we should say about the sad child. That's what we should say about the happy child. And to kind of integrate those things, it seems like the verdict is that no, you know, you guys should not go ahead. Uh, because you have every reason not to have the happy kid, no reason to have the, ha the, the, uh, the sad kid. Sorry, I said it the wrong way. You have every reason not to have the, the sad kid, no reason to have the happy kid, so no. Okay, now, let's go on to the, uh, the, the more realistic case where somebody has a child who is both happy and sad. Okay, now it seems like um, I'm about to pull a rabbit out of a hat. Um, if, given what we said about the twins, we should say something, basically the same thing about this child who is uh, both sad and happy. Um, there is every reason not to have the sad part of that child. Uh, there is no reason to have the happy part of that child. Um, and if you put those two things together, Presto, you get the same answer. No, you should not have that child. Um, so you guys should not have your strange twins, the happy and the sad. You guys should not have the happy, sad kid, um, <laughs> which you may not have wanted to anyway. These were not willing volunteers. I didn't <laughs> constrict them. <laughs> and uh, now, what's the punchline here? Now, David Benatar wrote this book called a Better never to have been the harm of coming into existence. Uh, his view is that nobody should have children anymore because all children that come into the world are some combination of happy and sad. Um, he thinks that we really ought to kind of uh, head towards the extinction of the human species and uh, end the story. Um, now, I see this as sort of a puzzle, uh, or, or even a paradox, or kind of ennobling it to call it a paradox. To call it a paradox is to say that it's a, a, at least a seemingly good argument for a very crazy conclusion. That's how I see it. I see it as a kind of cool argument for a very crazy conclusion. Um, some people would say it's not even that, it's just sort of transparent rubbish. But, um, so there, there are my two puzzles. Uh, let's see, do I have any time for salute for yeah, what, how much time do I have left? I'm not sure about that, but okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, now, now after that beautiful happy music and the lovely, you know, talking to a young person, I feel like I've now put, you know, doom and gloom into the room, so I need to kind of remove some of the doom and gloom. Um, so I want to say a little something about both of those puzzles. Um, coming back to the first one, um, about what's in it for me. Um, now there, I think we can solve that problem. I think that's uh, pretty manageable. Um, I think that one, one part of that sol the solution is that in that uh, day reconstruction method where you find out what people are doing all day, um, the problem is uh, with sort of detecting the happiness of parenthood is that it isn't a constant all day thing. I mean, I think that parenthood does involve a lot of chores and uh, and I would compare parenthood to sort of mountain climbing, whereas if anybody you know, who's experienced mountain climbing knows that three quarters of the time you're quite miserable. You know, you're sort of, you know, sort of chugging your way up the hill, your feet hurt, you're exhausted. Um, but when you stop at the lookouts, it's thrilling. And so I think that parenthood has those kinds of high highs. And, uh, and, and so um, even in, just in terms of happiness, ha Parenthood has its you know, beautiful payoffs. Uh, but I think another important thing is just to kind of realize that parenthood isn't just about being happy and cheerful. There's a kind of meaningfulness that's added to life by being a parent. Um, so I think if we think about what meaning is and how we get it from parenthood, uh, I think we can deal with the, the first puzzle. The second puzzle, I think, is more puzzling, more head scratching, oops, uh, more difficult. Um, so I think that to really solve that, uh, we would need to do a lot of yeah, fancy footwork. There's a, a lot of literature on this, on this puzzle, a lot of different solutions. And that's, I think, at the earmark of a good puzzle, 
when you have very smart people giving completely different solutions. So there are lots of solutions. But um, I wanted to say something uh, that isn't really a solution to this, but uh, I think may be helpful. Um, so let's come back to the child, uh, come back to happy, sad. And um, I think there's one way in which this way of thinking about human being is a, really a kind of a distortion um, that might be helpful in solving this problem. You know, might or might not. So, but let me just stress might. Um, and the reason why I want to say might is because it gives me a chance to tell a, stories, a few stories about my children. And uh, you know, that's, that's always a good thing. So, um, I think one way that this picture distorts things is that it makes it seem as if a life is just some good parts and some bad parts glued together. You know, there's, there's misery over here, there's happiness over here, and a life is just the two kind of stuck together. Um, I think that, that that's really not true exactly, and some of the solution might come from looking at life more accurately. Um, so let me tell you a little story about um, something that happened on Mother's Day that I think brings out how that picture is wrong. Um, on Mother's Day, we went, my uh, husband and my 14-year-old twins and I went to um, uh, the Natural Sculpture Museum. Um, and uh, my son dropped his iPod Touch onto a concrete sidewalk. The screen shattered and he had a very, very purple moment. Okay, <laughs> very, very purple. Um, and uh, so a half an hour later, we were driving to a restaurant, and I said, let's just go to the Apple store and see what they say about this. You know, can it be fixed? Something. So we go to the Apple store, we talk to the person at the, the Genius Bar, as, as they call it. Um, and he looks at it and says, completely hopeless, but we will let you have a new one for half off. So we'll give it to you for $150. He's still feeling, you know, fairly lousy. Um, the, the guy then turns on the iPod and sees my son's uh, wallpaper or background, uh, which says, the road to hell is paved with Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> the guy then says, I love your wallpaper. I'll give it to you for free. <laughs> followed by a yellow moment. But I think that it's just actually a distortion because what, what really went on should be thought of as a total experience lasting, you know, an hour, starting with the drop and ending with the free iPod. If you think of the total experience, it was sort of all one big yellow um, because that purple moment got redeemed by the later experience. Um, and so I think life is not really just purples and yellows kind of smooshed together but these holes where the bad stuff gets sort of redeemed uh, by the good stuff. Okay, so I think that if a lot of bad stuff gets redeemed, then we get away from this whole image and we don't, and we just don't have the problem to solve that Benatar has given us. It's just the wrong picture altogether. Um, now, sadly enough, I don't really think that's the whole solution to this puzzle. I think it's a better puzzle than that. Um, but. Uh, I just want to just leave it, leave it there um, with philosophy begins in wonder because um, the puzzlement is really a point. Uh, and uh, if you find it puzzling, um, there is more to be read. Um, my, I have a new article about parenthood and meaning, meaning that's in uh, the Philosopher's Magazine. It's online, it's both on newsstands and in, uh, online. And David Benatar has a, a article on the, on the same issue. And if you really love the guy, he has a whole book on this stuff. And he will he argues in mu in a much more subtle way uh, for his view. That's that's all. I have to say. I have, I have a puzzle, but I have one question: Did David Benatar really feel that way? Why does he just commit suicide? Well, I actually think that's a good question, and he has about 20 pages of his book about why why his position on birth does not lead to the conclusion that he should commit suicide. But in, in the literature, I think it's a very good question. And some of the literature on this argues that um, his view about birth uh, just leads inevitably to the idea that 
he, it's time for him to go. <laughs> so, you know, it, it certainly, I think he is the life sucks philosopher. And um, it, that might have, you know, real life implications for him. I think that's a good point.